Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. My key text is going to be Isaiah 45. We're going to read the first six verses there. But I want to premise what I'm going to talk about today by going to Jeremiah chapter 32. And I'm going to read two verses. I want to encourage you today. I want to strengthen you today. I want to give you some word today. Who's going to help me? So thankful. I, I want even those of you online, I know we prefer you to be here. And I'm telling you, you, you can't really get this at home like you do here but get what you can there. We're going to pray for you. Get involved in this too as much as you can, but I want to, I'm going to read this to you in, in, in verse 17. Our Lord God, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Say that. There's nothing too hard for thee. <laughs> for thee, not me, thee. <laughs> Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in work. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men. He sees you. Right. To give everyone according to his ways according to the fruit of his doings. Now, I don't want to be the most spiritually materialistic person of the bunch, but I am in here to praise God, and I want to make sure, I want him to know that I'm going to praise him and worship him and shout. I come to church wearing my Sunday best because you know what? I do want God to know that I honor, respect, and reverence him, and I just don't want a Sunday relationship with God. See, the problem in the world today, we've got a bunch of weekend relationship people. That we, there's another term, kind of a term, one night stands. I, I, I want a lifetime relationship with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. It's Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 6. Praise God. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have hold, to subdue. Nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which calleth thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known Think you've got an in with God because you've been around a little while? God is an equal opportunity anointer. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Oh, let's give him praise right now. Let's put down your Bible. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to work. You are king of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. I'm thankful to know you, God. I'm thankful to say your name and worship you in the house of God today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you're seated, I want you to give someone you're standing by, a couple people, a high five, and say, remove the boundaries and limitations. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. God is good. 
Amen. Praise God. You know, years and years ago, back in the, the 1600s, originally New York was named New Amsterdam, populated by a cornucopia of people, but mainly the Dutch. Uh, they were a colony established by the Dutch West India Company in 1624. And the colony grew to encompass all of present day New York City, parts of Long Island, Connecticut, and New Jersey. The successful Dutch settlement in the colony grew up in the southern tip of Manhattan Island and was christened New Amsterdam. There's a plan that is called the Costello Plan that they used for the street names and the original map of that area. That's the earliest known map of New Amsterdam created by a gentleman by the name of Cortelieu in 1660. Now there's a story that as New York was in its infancy or this area was in its infancy, infancy in the beginnings, historians tell us that the founding fathers had a meeting when they're planning the city. They noticed more and more people were inhabiting the area and they needed in order to you have to understand, imagine our streets without stop signs and stop lights and lines in the road and rules and organization. So they're starting to organize the city. And as it was expanding and the population was growing, they decided to lay out and plan the city and how big they thought the city would get. Now at this time, there was only roughly, really about seven streets. And so as they discussed the city and began to draw out their plans, they projected what they thought was a large enough plan for how far they could see the city to grow. They laid out the streets and began to number them, reaching beyond their wildest imaginations at the time. They drew out 19 streets. They felt to grow to 19 streets would be a stretch, would, would, would be a big stretch. In fact, they were so confident that the city of New York, it said, would never need more than 19 streets. So instead of calling the 19th Street 19th Street, it is said they named it Boundary Street because in their minds, a 19th Street would be the border of the city. Believe it or not, Wall Street, if you go back in history, literally was a street with a wall to keep the Indians out. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Now, because of the present day that we live, we kind of realize that the city fathers were a little short-sighted. It turns out, you know, at last count, and I looked it up this morning, the highest numbered street in Manhattan Island is 220th Street in Inwood. The northbound numerations that begin in Manhattan continue through the, through the Bronx until New York City meets Yonkers at West 263rd Street. That's not counting the avenues, the boulevards, and the other streets with other names. The city fathers had set a boundary as far as they could see. They were saying, well, this is only as far as New York is going to go. So let's call the 19th Street the Boundary Street. So they made a mark on paper. They drew a line in the sand. They, their vision was... 19 streets, and they called it boundary. This is where it ends. This is where we will stop. There, there's no reason to build or go beyond this point. Uh, there's no reason to go any further. So let's not plan any further than this. Uh, that's as far as they could see. So they set limitations. Matthew chapter 19, verse uh, 26, Jesus beheld them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Luke 18 and 27 says, and he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. 
in our lives, each and every one of us have what we call our limitations. Physical, mental, social. We have our own personal boundaries. We have our own set of parameters and limitations which we live by. I have found the older I get, the more limitations of what I'm willing to do. <laughs> I don't run to answer my phone anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. People are finding that out. Call my wife back. Why didn't you answer your phone? Well, I don't say that because I didn't want to run the answer. I said, well, I was busy. Limitation. It hurts to run now. A lot of times I got a furry dog in my way that doesn't understand the word move as quickly as I, do. I have the need for her to move. You understand what I, and she follows me wherever I go. So sometimes she's underfoot. Sometimes I, hey, you know. So we have our own plans, our own, our own mental blueprints of our do's and our don'ts. And from the time we get up to the time we lay down, we live within personal boundaries and limitations. We have our time and our energy, our finances, our food. We all set Boundaries. I've even found that in my younger years, I didn't set boundaries on how much I ate. I set boundaries now. In fact, just last night, my wife and I were talking about, we have got to quit eating this late. It's a boundary, folks. I can't eat late and lay down. Internal physical boundaries don't like that. <laughs> Most of the time, whether we acknowledge it or not, we actually set limitations on just about everything. And we say, this is where the boundary is. This is my line in the sand. This is as far as I go. I'm setting my limitations and I declare I'm capable of, of this, but I'm not capable of that. And so much like the city fathers of New Amsterdam, which became New York, we kind of park plant our feet and we go no further. We sit ourselves down our own personal boundary street and say, this is only far as I can go. And when we see anything that even hints about going further, we point to our line and say, ah, ain't going that far. Nope, I can't do that. That's too much, requires too much, costs too much. I'm not going to do it. We do that also in our spiritual life. We do that in our relationship with God. We, we, we've come so far, we turn and say, no, God, can't do it. That's not in my resume. I'm not feeling that one, God. That's, that's not in the job description that I've accepted in you, Lord. That's outside my parameters. That's outside the boundary line of my Christianity. My mind says no, my history says no, my DNA says that's beyond me, that's just who I am. <laughs> I'm just a regular person. And unlike the song that we just sang that was so profoundly on time, I am who I say I am, God. And if you say it long enough, that's what you will be. That's beyond me. That's outside my skills. That's, that's, that's beyond my risk zone. That's beyond what I can see. That's beyond what I've done in the past. It's kind of reminded right now of putting new wine in old wine skins. <laughs> Some of us become, become old Bags, okay. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm just not that flexible anymore. Uh, it's past my ability to believe. It's beyond my faith. It's uh, too far and now my faith is gone and I become worried uh, rather than a worshiper saying, I can do all things through Christ. You say, wait a minute, Jesus, I ain't doing that. 
The amazing thing is that here in our text, we have the potential for a Boundary Street moment. You find breaking boundaries and limitations and going beyond is actually a theme in God's great book. God is an expert in taking the average and going beyond. He, he excels in taking something that is not and making it become. He, there's just something about a vessel in the hands of an almighty God, no matter where you came from. Oh, no matter what you've been. You ought to understand, he can take the mediocre and do more. Now, I know some of y'all don't want to move. You're afraid to get stretched a little bit. That's okay. The Bible tells he does look to and fro. In other words, he might look right past your stiff self. He might have such a blessing to pour out, but you're unwilling to the altar. You're unwilling to be stretched. You're unwilling to see beyond the boundaries. Okay, sit yourself down. Let me find someone willing. Willing to break the boundaries. Willing to take the test. Willing to take. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I've been around this thing a long time. I'm, I, just made, I love it when new people offend the old folks. Yeah, you're bothered by that. Let me say this. Be seated. Let me teach a little bit. Anybody have an automobile? Holiness, physical holiness standards of dressing modest is a wonderful thing. And many people stress about what they won't do. Holiness, holiness. And I get that. And I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for it in its place. But your car and my car does not start with only a negative pole. You just can't be about things you won't do. There's got to be positive things that you're willing to do to create the circuit. Or the car will not start, never mind run. It's not about what you won't do. It's about what you're doing for God. Oh, see, the problem is we, we stand on, oh, I got long sleeves and oh, I got this and oh, I got that. And that's great. But well, breaking the boundaries and doing, where's your doing? To be close to God isn't just the, 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 the outward standards, but it's a matter of the heart. Mm-hmm. God spoke the world into existence. He delivered Israel with a stuttering, murdering Moses. He used Samson and a jawbone to slay a thousand men. He, he turned Gideon into a mighty man of valor. He called the things that are not as though they were. Why? Because he breaks boundaries. He tears down limitation. He set the earth in its place told the oceans where to stop. God is infinitely available to do more than we ask or think if we're saying, God, use me. Now, I know it's going to be beyond. You're going to have to stretch a little bit today. And some of you haven't spiritually stretched in so long, so it's going to hurt. Believe it or not, now I can't do it right now. And I won't even try to, I used to be able to do the splits. Also in martial arts, if you can't, one of the first things you do is the splits. Can I get an amen? amen. I did martial arts. If you can't, I used to pride myself on the fact that I could kick the top of a door, door jam standing in front of the door. Bam! I do that now. Call the paramedics. Yes. I'm going to need a doctor. Yes. I might even need CPR, maybe a hit me with 10 paddles to get my heart back. Because I ain't stretched myself physically. And some of us are like that spiritually. You're stuck. You got your boundaries. And you're like, Where's God? I'll tell you where God is. Stuck by your boundaries. Listen, Ephesians, Paul speaking. What better person than Paul? That Christ in verse 17 of chapter 3. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. 
that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, and depth, and height. What's he talking about? How big is God? Well, there's no way he fills everything. <laughs> and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. See, the problem of us, some of us, I'm stopping right here. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to release myself to worship like that or to live like that. I, I got boundaries. I, I got my dignity. It's a boundary. I got what everybody thinks of me. Come on. Yeah. Now unto him that is able to do what? Exceedingly in a I don't know what that means to you, but that exceeding, listen to all these words, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask, or God can do more. You haven't even thought how big he can go. You haven't even thought how far he can go. You've limited yourself. If you would comprehend how great and how big and powerful, you would throw away some boundaries. Stop the limitation. Preach like you've never preached. Live like you never lived. You'd be a Christian that could set the world on fire. Turn your home right side up. Turn around a messed up world. Now, God in his benevolence allowed Paul to put an ending statement because there's some going to be wounded when you leave here today. That that power is limited. Not by God. Because he says according to the power that. What is one of the most disheartening feelings on the planet? Going out to your car. Click, click. Click, click. This happened just, I don't know, last week, week before. Erica came, went, hey, my car's not starting. She had a negative, positive pole problem. Her battery was dead. Right when the cold weather snapped in here. We call it cold, but we really don't have cold weather here. She needed a new battery. Mm -hmm. We don't like it when things don't work. We don't like it when they even perform to the minimal standards. So there's a situation here, and I need to get back in our text. We have Isaiah, God's man of the hour, the, the prophet. And as the Spirit of God begins to move on him, he begins to prophesy about a Persian king named Cyrus. Now listen, Cyrus isn't even born yet at the time of the prophecy. He doesn't come on the scene until after over 100 years later. And here's the kicker. Even when he's alive, Cyrus doesn't follow or acknowledge God. God gives this prophecy of this future blessing and this calling to Cyrus, a king, a guy that doesn't and won't know him, that doesn't serve him, a king that literally ruled the kingdom that was holding Israel hostage in slavery. He was using this king. Legalistically speaking, you could even go as far as calling Cyrus an enemy of God. And if he's an enemy of God, he's an enemy of God's man. I got some, y'all awesome. Now, some of you are thrown off probably by the phrase by legalistically speaking. But legalistically speaking is when you make assumptions solely based on what you see. Some people are spiritually bound. I give if I knew, well, then it wouldn't be faith. I go if I knew, then it wouldn't be, because without faith, it's impossible to please. So some of you have actually literally stopped on the wrong side of faith. When he comes back, he's not looking for the perfect. He's looking for those that have you could be sitting here in all your holy, personal holiness, glory, and be on the wrong side of faith and the wrong side of God. See, right now I'm preaching to us saintly people. You know, 
those of us that read our Bibles every day and pray every day and turn around and try to convert a bunch of rank sinners to even catch up to us, not realizing we don't even have faith in God. We don't do it because we have faith. We do it, well, bless God, let me get to church. After church, oh, you did a good job, Pastor. That was a great song, and they missed it. Let me ask this question. How close were you were to the Lord of Lords? So we get bound because of all our legalese and our poor sense, our mindset, our resume. When it comes to the things of God, that's always a mistake. Because if you don't have a place in you, if there's not a part of you that has an open mind for God to do what he can do, You lack faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. On paper, Cyrus doesn't look like a very good candidate. He's a pagan king. He doesn't know God, and yet Cyrus has a call. He has an opportunity. That ought to tell every one of us in shape. Wait a second, everyone. Wait a minute. What have I been doing in my life these last few years? What have I been doing with you? I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I got the Bible. I believe the truth. I believe salvation. I believe... What have I done with my opportunity? And throughout this prophecy, we run into all kinds of boundaries. We come across all these lines in the sand. We come across all these little marks on paper that say, sorry, Cyrus, you can't pass here. You're a pagan. There's some boundaries in place. There are some barriers here that you're not supposed to cross. You're a fraud, Cyrus. That, Despite all that, that's true. Despite all those boundaries that are in place, We have a but God moment here. At each and every one of the boundaries that you and I would place, that society would put in place, God says, I'm still going to do this. I'm still going to do that. (laughs) You, You see limitations, I see unlimited potential. You, 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 you see Gideon threshing wheat. God sees a mighty man of valor. You see Paul wrecking the church and killing people. He sees his greatest convert. You look around this room and you see your spouse or your kid or something. But God says, I see a mighty man of valor. I see a lady that's going to turn her family around. I see a man that's going to pray down fire from heaven. Because when you read a little further on Isaiah 45, it it, kind of reads a little different. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand have holden to subdue nations before him. That's a boundary. I will loose the loins of kings. That's a boundary. To open before him two leaved gates, because that's a boundary. Hallelujah. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight, breaking down another boundary. I will break in pieces the gates of brass because that was a boundary and cut asunder the bars of iron. Why? Because that's a boundary. Here's someone, he doesn't know God, but God is destroying limitations. He's removing boundaries. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness. That was a boundary. The hidden riches of secret places. That's a boundary. That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name am the God of Israel. Maybe you need to get back to letting God break some down some boundaries and limitations so you can get back to like Isaiah. I see the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills the top. Oh, remove the boundaries in my heart, in my mind, in my age, in my pride. Constantly. In those six verses, he's removing boundary after boundary that they may know from the rising of the sun from the west that there's none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. 
There are literally 10 boundaries that stand in front of Cyrus. At each one, God declares. God says, despite all that you see, despite the impossibilities, despite the limitations, despite the boundaries, don't stop, keep going. Don't let the gates, don't let people say, don't, regardless of every obstacle you see or face, no matter what you're, keep going. Oh, but that gate's made out of brass. Don't worry about it. Keep going. We're going to break it down. Those bars are made of iron. I don't care. Keep going. I'm going to break it down. At every boundary, he's told, don't stop. Keep going. The scripture tells us that Cyrus, the pagan king, the guy who doesn't look too promising on paper. who really has no potential, the guy who won't register on the who's who of God's great people list. Who? The Cyrus guy. Who's that? I hate to break it to you. He's the one who sets things in motion. It was Cyrus. It was what he did. It's how God used him to send the Jews back to Israel. Back. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you look a little further in Ezra 1 and 1. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Isaiah wasn't the only one prophesying about it. The Lord stirreth up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, if you're easily offended, don't listen. If God can stir up the spirit of a non-believer to do something for God, how can you just sit there? How do you go home Week after week, month after month, yeah, and haven't moved a muscle. Come on. Come on. Haven't changed a thing. Haven't stirred nothing up. God stirred him so Amazingly, he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, let the Jews go, let my people go. And then for the rest of that chapter, he goes on through the proclamation. The spirit could stir Cyrus despite all the spiritual and legal roadblocks. Think of that. God wasn't hindered by boundaries. God was not stopped by limitations in spite of everything that should block him and stop him. Everything that said no about Cyrus, God said, watch. You could sit there and ridicule and complain about your neighbor, your family member, but I'm gonna tell you something. If God moves on them and he let, and they let him, you need to get the gist of it. They're going to start doing things while you sit by and watch. The gist of this entire thing. Send the Jews back to rebuild their land. Let them to rebuild their city. Oh, hallelujah. God's all about letting people go. Breaking limitations. Tearing down boundaries. It's bigger than that. It's, it's still bigger than that because not only did <laughs> this will let you know where you're at. This is going to sting. Now, not only did he move on Cyrus to let the people go, but he's now all the tightwads are going to get hurt here. All you non-givers, non-tithers, those you, you, you go extravagant for yourself, but you'll stingy for God. He said, you know what, Persia? 
well, you're not just going to let his people go. You're going to give them what they need to rebuild. I've heard this story before. <laughs> you're going to help them however you can. If they need a hammer, you're going to give them a hammer. <laughs> if they need an ox, you're going to give them an ox. <laughs> and by the way, go get your gold and go get your silver. Go get the vessels that were stolen from their temple. Ah, when you read, and you're going to give it all back. You're going to hand it all back to, why? Because God is going to move on an unbeliever. And if he can move on an unbeliever, how should he be able to move on the likes of you and I if we'll take the limitations off, if we'll remove the boundary and say, God, use me again. Get me back in the fight. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. I'm tired of sitting on the sideline. I'm tired of my boundaries. I'm tired of my limitations. Hallelujah. Now, I need, to, I need to hurry. I need to hurry. You can be seated. Now, this is all well and good, and we shout about it. And I, I like shouting just like the rest of you, but in all honesty, it's not how high you jump or how loud you shout on Sunday. It's really how you walk on Monday. Okay? Mm-hmm. And you notice about the Ezra 1 and 1, it says the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. God didn't just say, you know, Cyrus, you're going to do some great things. God's the one who set it all in motion. God was given permission to stir his heart. God didn't draw up the blueprint and leave it at that. He's the first one to swing the hammer. He's involved. God takes Cyrus and has him go places and do things he never would have done on his own. That's one of the most amazing things about God. I'm still young enough in the Lord to still remember that God will take you places you never dreamed or thought. You can do things and go places you never even dreamed you could go. What am I saying? God's plans are bigger than ours because God's map is bigger than we're so busy drawing boundaries straight in our life but the boundary streets we've laid out in our lives have no bearing on God David makes a statement in Psalms 23 and verse 4 Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Everybody knows that. But the interesting thing is the premise behind it. David starts the psalm out by pointing out that God is his shepherd. Not his sidekick. That's the difference, folks. also says he leads me he can only lead those willing to submit to him he's going to lead me wherever I go that's pretty interesting considering David's story wait a minute David said that the little shepherd boy Turn giant slayer? How'd that happen? The youngest of eight brothers turned king of Israel? How did that happen? What took, who does David think he is? Well, actually, I think that's what his brothers asked him. <laughs> did you hear that? 
At every turn, David went beyond boundaries. Let me tell you something. God will take you places you never thought it possible to go. Listen, nobody chooses to go through the valley of the shadow of death. But when you're walking with God, look out, Valley. Now, see, see, I'm going to be honest here. Some of us have felt pain and we become hesitant. In fact, some of us have stopped. And we're stuck in the same thing that hurt us. I'm not saying that what happened to you wasn't wrong or what they did was wrong. But the problem is you've wronged yourself worse by being stuck there with unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred. And you're mad at the church. You hate church. You're upset at God. How could he let this happen to me? But the problem is you've missed out on the other side of the valley because you stopped in the shadow. You stayed in the darkness instead of walking to the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've all had pain. We've all had struggle. But the difference, don't say, okay, he didn't just lead me here. He wants to lead me to, I'm going to keep walking. I'm not setting a boundary. I'm not about to stop. I'm not going to quit. Hey, wait a minute. I'm not going to stay here in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to keep on walking through it. That's what God can do with a believer's life. But I want to I want to focus on Cyrus here. He's a pagan king. Pagan kings don't usually give back spoils of war. <laughs> Look, I'll tell you right now. If we go outside and we have a bet on something for pink slips and I win, you're not getting your car back from me. If we, you know, have a challenge and there's a hundred bucks on the line and I win, I'm, you're going to give it to me. Right? Now, I don't gamble and all that kind of stuff, but dumb stuff happens and some of the, I can do it. I go, oh, let me see, a hundred bucks. I'll do it. It's just me. It's my, you know, hey, put your, put your money where your mouth is or sit down and shut up, whatever it is, you know. So, we're talking about a pagan. Yeah, he's got no ethical morals. He's a pagan king. Oh boy, he sure puts some of us to shame though, don't he? He gives back spoils. We don't even give God back what he gave us. Mm, we tight wasted, tight fisted, and all bitter and angry at God because life didn't look the way he did. And he said, It would have if you'd have kept letting me lead. Right? We don't do good things on our own. Well, maybe I'm telling on me. Look, I'll tell you right now, if it wasn't for God, I, in fact, I've had this conversation with my wife recently with a lot of stuff going on. I said, I know why God saved me. Because I know the thoughts in my Holy Ghost filled Christian mind now that I have to subdue because what I'd like to do right now. You'd be surprised what's floating around in this room. You'd be surprised with some people. And normally it's those guys that are, that are jumping up and down. And, ah, I really can't talk about it. I need Jesus. I don't do godly things without God. I, I, I've proven that enough to myself. I don't walk in here with a corner on holiness in God. I, I don't ever want to get so belligerent with God that I walk in here and think that, oh, they need me. I better stick around because I better keep an eye on it. You ever thought that maybe God's brought somebody in because he's tired of things just sticking around? God, bring, God will bring a preacher in your life. He'll bring something to stir your life. Hey, wait a minute, folks. God's using a worldly pagan king. But when you think about Cyrus and what he did, and how all those spoils of war came back to Israel. And you transpose that with what David said. Because as David brings on and says, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Let me 
the difference. I got evil with me and I got God with me. So you have a decision to make. Which one you going to listen to? Are you going to be fearful or faithful? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Don't clap yet. Don't clap because this is going to get worse. He doesn't answer that with, I'm going to cuddle you and love you and give you flowery pathways of ease. This is how he answered it. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. What? That's like saying my dad's belt comforts me. <laughs> now when I'm that 15-year-old kid, that 12-year-old kid, and the belt, that belt wasn't comforting. But it is today. I still have it. He's long gone, over 30 something years. I still have it. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David makes this reference to the rod and the staff of God because you see, in shepherding, the rod and the staff have two different roles. The rod was used to correct. There's a little correcting going on right now. From the oldest to the youngest, none of us is void in this thing. Because understand, all we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep will always do something. They'll do stuff they're not supposed to. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but sheep aren't the sharpest animals. I'm not going to get into that, but that's not my message today, but they're not. And so when a sheep didn't do what it was supposed to, the shepherd would press it on its side to redirect it. If it's nipping or causing a problem, get out of there. We get those. Anybody get those? I still get those. And then the staff was used to pull the sheet close. That hooked part of the staff. He would reach over that hook and pull you close. We need both. The rod was used to correct. The staff was used to console. I need him to walk with me and lead me through the valley. Don't look. I still need the rod and I still need the staff. Lord, I don't always know why dark times come into our lives. I don't know. But that, that rod and staff is for correction and redirection. It's because there are some things that God has to work out in our lives. Hard times and trials and times like that. I need the staff. I need redirected. Even Jesus said to his disciples about those that become offended in him. I didn't realize it, but about three years in the living for God, I, be, I was offended at God. I got to be transparent because there's some people here in the world. I don't care how old you are. You can be offended at God at something in your life. I was praying and dealing with something and I made a statement to somebody and they looked at me and without any reservation, you're mad at God and you're blaming God. You're offended because of how your dad died. All of a sudden, the floodgates came open. And all of a sudden, the rod that he poked me with the truth, I felt the hook of consolation and he pulled me close. And I'm here today because I realize he can take you through the valley of the shadow of death and you come out on the other side. Oh, I'm not going to get offended. I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep trusting. I'm going to keep... I don't have to understand it all. I just have to walk with the one that does. I have to keep close to the one that does. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's no boundaries. There's no boundaries. I can feel the phenomenal love and a pulling of God's love. Whether it's his rod or it's his staff, I know that you care for me. 
I know you're the one holding it. I know the one you're in control of it. I know you're the one leading me. You can lead me even in the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't matter. I'm ready to break limitations and go through boundaries. God has a way of leading us through. Not just to. If you got stuck, God's not stuck. We get stuck. I just don't see how God can do that. So, <laughs> God has a tendency. It's what he does. He takes us past our boundaries. He leads us beyond our limitations. He takes us to places beyond where we can see and like David, he took him from the household into the sheepfold and led him from bears to lions on the giants and to becoming a king. How? He never stopped letting God lead him, chastise him, correct him, or bless him. There's something wrong if we'll only accept blessings from God and not correction. We become babes. There's something wrong with you if you're 30 years old and you're mad at your parents still. <laughs> There's something wrong. You still spit that pacifier out of your mouth. Oh, mom and dad didn't let me do this. And mom and dad didn't let me. Oh, they spanked me for this. You know what? This generation and this mindset has ruined so many great people because they're stuck on what someone said they sh shouldn't have happened to them. Everybody will say, well, you shouldn't have had to lose your dad. But it happened. You want me to stay stuck there? Anybody that's seen the Lion King knows better than this. What? Maybe you need a monkey in your life. I'll play the monkey. Remember Rafiki? Swing and say, bam! Oh, that hurt. He swung in and he like, how do you say? It's in the past. Get over it. Life ain't over. In fact, learn from it. Move on. Get better. Be better. Do better. Take off the limits. Quit crying. Go beyond. Remove the limitations. God's bigger than the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, wait a minute. But did you die? Come on. Get moving. God's greater. Now, B.B. B, B said, I know I, I need to hurry. Lord, I need to hurry. I'll be honest with you. I, I cannot. I'm the, I'm the greatest Petri dish example I know. Put me in there and just look at my little life and it's little, you know, little fungus and little things moving. Oh, just imagine the angels all looking around at my little life. Like, a, oh, God. Oh, God. Really? Him? The problem is, is we look in our own little petri dish of life. As soon as I start doing that, oh, I can't do that, God. I can't, have, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people. And those of you in the leadership meetings and those of you that, some of you I can't be honest with because it'll hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get you to set your feelings aside, remove the boundaries and realize what you can do. Because it bothers me when I see amazing people hit the wall of their self-imposed limitations. When they put their own boundaries up. Oh, I ain't never done that before. Well, whose fault is that? They become predict. Oh, okay, I, I'm going to hurt someone's feelings here. You become predictable. You eat the same things, you say the same things, you sit in the same place, you always do this, nothing change. You're predictable. You're in a rut. You know what a rut is? It's no different than a graveyard hole. It's a hole in the ground and you're stuck in it. Well, 
but this is me. This is how I am. I'm old enough now that I can't say, well, I'm old school. I'm glad God's not stuck. God, do a new thing in me. Now, I'll be honest, I hate to even go here with this, but I'll be honest with you. I've got, I've got this pill in my life. I'm a pill, it's a problem. Now, I chose to have the problem. I want the problem. I want to improve the problem. I'm excited about the problem, but it's a problem. Okay, and, and, and for years, for years, I've, I've, I've had old vehicles and I've liked to restore them. And I've, I've got one I'm working on. Right now. I don't know what's going on here, but that freaks me out. I can do what I want with it. And it's messed me up. Because I have so many boundaries. And I found myself the other day almost asking someone else, would you choose for me? Can you imagine if David let his brother choose for him? Listen. David showed up. He's a messenger boy bringing some lunch. Saul is trembling in his tent as this giant bellowed in the valley. Saul could not see God past the boundary of how big the giant was. You've heard this before, but stick with me. All Saul could envision were the boundaries and limitations of his armor the hand-to-hand -hand combat, probably the size of the giant spear, and risking losing his position as king and even his life. But when you take and dissect this story, listen to me. Saul was king on one side in a tent, but there was a boundary because he was king on one side and there was a giant on the other side, a valley in the middle. Saul couldn't see past the physical boundaries that he self-imposed. He, he lost the battle without ever fighting it. Wait a minute. Some of us need to restore this. Wait, don't you tell me I can't do something. What's sad is you don't want people to tell you, but you'll tell yourself you can't do stuff all the time. Saul's struggle wasn't what people were telling him. Saul's struggle was what he was telling himself. In fact, the story, he would never even face the giant. The people of God were stalemated without even a whisper. In fact, the enemy was the one dictating the conflict. The enemy wants you to fight on his terms. The enemy set the boundaries and the rules. In fact, it says in Samuel 17, 8, 9, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are you come out and set your battle in array? Why are you acting like you're going to fight? Am not I a Philistine and you the servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. There's a stalemate. This wasn't just a weekend, Brother Bruce. Sister Jessica, this went on for 40 days. You can be stuck in a rut for a long time, folks. So God showed up in this mess. Now, God didn't show up looking like you think he should show up. God showed up how he wanted. Mm. I said God showed up. No, David wasn't God, but David's what, David was God's way of showing up. Mm. <laughs> Some of you don't realize he's wanting you to be the David in your life. He's wanting mm. He hasn't called me to that. No, you haven't showed up for that. 
Listen, these guys have been fighting for over a month. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side. Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. 1 Samuel 17 and 3. The Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. David was not the answer. God was the answer. David was just the vessel that God used to handle the answer. Oh. Because David facing a giant is an absolute travesty. Nobody would do that. That should not have happened. Because it violated every boundary and rule they had set in place. The first thing God did was break the very first rule of the fight. Goliath spent 40 days demanding another man to fight. God said, well, okay. First of all, you don't set the rules I do. I'm sending a boy. Oh. Uh, some of, you, some of you ought to get empowered by that. Wait a minute. If he can do that with a boy, what could he do with me today? What could he do? If you got all this time in church and all this wisdom and all this knowledge and you're full of the Holy Ghost, how could you be sitting on the sideline? How could you demand to have a title and be all powerful in the, and be sitting on the sidelines? God's been telling humanity for centuries. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts are yours. Why are you on the sidelines when you got all that ability? God is saying, I will not be held captive by your boundaries and by your impossibilities. Goliath is demanding a Man and God sent a boy. Now, well, God will insult you if you continue to defy Him. God will embarrass you. I heard it all that God's a gentleman, not to the enemies, and not if it'll help you change. Well, you don't think his brothers were embarrassed when they told him, "You little hot little child, go home and few sheep." God will embarrass you if you persist in mocking him. You talk about being a man of God, a lady of God. You've been serving God all these years and you're on the sidelines. God will embarrass you. God will take someone with less and do more. Someone with less talent, with less resources, with less ability, can't do it. And he'll have them do more than you because you sat there and thought it was about you instead of keeping it about God and moving forward. Tear down the boundaries of what you say you can. God can. God defies the army of Israel. God defies the rule. He defies the odds. He breaks limitations. Right. Are you willing to stand up and say, Here I am, Lord, send me? He took experience. And defeated with inexperience. He took strength and beat it with weakness. He took that giant size and extreme smallness. All those great weapons that are so listed. God sends a boy with a slingshot. What's God saying? There ain't no boundaries. There ain't no limitations. David was God's way of saying, it's time to go beyond boundaries and limitations. With God, all things are possible. We ought to give God praise right now. We ought to thank him right now. We ought to exalt him, lift up, magnify him right now. Glory. I trust you, Lord. Hallelujah. God broke through all the boundaries and defeated this giant. Listen, your actions and your words should always agree with each other. I'm getting old here and I'm trying to teach you men to do things, younger men. I never want to be teaching 
from the realm of words and not experience. Because that's where Saul was. David, let me tell you how to do it. He was trying to place his boundaries on David. But David had enough wisdom that, wait a minute, you got a lot of words and you got a lot of stuff, but you lack the action and the inspiration to do it. You sat here for 40 days and it's, wait a minute. God's been breaking barriers in my life for a long time now. I can tell you, Saul, of a lion and a bear. <laughs> Listen, Saul, entitlement will never outdo inspiration. Titles will never outdo faith. Uh, resources will never outdo anointing. Saul was entitled and entangled. He was bound by barriers. David was inspired and anointed and free to do exploits. What are exploits? Beyond boundaries, beyond limitation, beyond what's been done. Are you ready to break through some of your preconceived boundaries and God? You've never, you've never shouted in church before. You've never worshiped before. Start doing it. You've never taught a Bible study. Start teaching it. Maybe it's time you shattered your status quo. Maybe it's time you realized, and I'm not just talking about drugs. I'm talking about proclivities and anything else that's been a part of your life for so long that you've known more for it than you are God. Maybe it's time to break through your addiction. Break out of old family strongholds. Break out of education limitations. Break through spiritual stagnation. Tear down some walls. Tear down some barriers. Can you still be stirred by the Spirit of God today? Will you be stirred by the Spirit of God today? Will you allow Him to anoint you again? Will you let Him order your steps again? Direct your steps. Someone's going to be unrecognizable by their family here pretty soon. Someone's going to turn around and the whole world, who's that? I don't know. You're going to have to say who that is because they're not going to recognize you because God's done something. Stay standing. I need to wrap this up. See, the problem is some of you are too recognizable. Look that way, act that way, live that way, and done everything the same way for so long. God hadn't done anything in your life in so long. People are like, okay, whatever. Brother Ezekiel, one of the most painful, but yet one of the most poignant things that were ever said to me when I started living for God. Now, get, get, let me qualify this because there's just some idiot out there. I, I haven't done everything right from then until now. In fact, the only thing I've done right is, you know what? I've always, I kept getting up. I kept trusting God. That's it. You know what they said to me? This is a true story, Carla. My own family looked at me and said, we liked it better when you were selling drugs. Did it hurt? With the mindset of their boundaries, yes. But it also empowered. You know what it said to me? They know I'm, di they know I'm different. I don't look the same. I'm not doing the same. In fact, ah, Brother Bruce the other day, they're not done criticizing. And that's I love them anyway. I pray for them every day. I fast for them. In fact, I haven't prayed as much for them as I have recently. It's been amazing. It's something, you know, just like Job. It's always someone to bring you bad news. Someone told me the other day, yeah, your sister was listening to your message. She said, well, when did he start getting like that? And made it, I guess I said something with a, with a slang or what, what was said? What? I had an accent or something. Well, I'll be like, well, man, I hate to break it to you, sweetheart, but we haven't talked in over 10 years. I kind of done some stuff. See, see, see. See, a lot of times that that is familiar becomes fatal because we want to relate to it.
family wants you to relate to them and God wants you to relate to him. And they'll always see little Ezekiel and never see the man of God. They'll always see the David and not a giant killer. You know why? They didn't witness him killing the bear. They did not see him take out a lion. So when he showed up with all that ability, you're just David. See, see, you could struggle. Even, even as long as you live for God, Brother Davenport, you're just Brother Davenport. You're just Brother Freddie Bruce. You're just Lawrence. You're just Carl. You're just the whole family. Oh, that's just Jessica. But you know what you need to do? You know what, God? I don't want their boundaries. And I don't want their limitations. They're not going to lead me through the valley of the shadow of death. See, they don't understand that on the other side of the valley of the shadow of death, there's green pastures and still waters. Ah! <laughs> Take off the limitations and allow me to do things that when they see me the next time, who's that? Who's that? Oh, wait, who's that? I tell you who that is. Are you ready for a breakthrough in your own family crisis? Are you ready for your home to change, your life to change? Are you ready for something different?